Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the presentation today. Uh, the Mass Pequot Library is very happy that the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society can come down and do this presentation for us. And, um, and that said, I leave it in the hands of the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. Thank you so much, Lee, for having us. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay, and I am the Education Coordinator for the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. And here tonight with me is Sammy, and she is one of our field biologists. So she'll be moderating the chat this evening. So like Lee said, if you have any questions or comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. And if possible, Sammy will try to pause me uh, to ask the question if it's relevant to the current topic we're on. And if not, she'll definitely read the questions out at the end. Um, so if we don't have any questions or comments as of now, we will get started with the presentation, which is Cetaceans of New York, Whales, Dolphins, and Porpoises, Oh My. So I always like to take a moment at the beginning of our programs to thank our partners and sponsors because we truly would not be able to fulfill our mission of promoting marine conservation without their help and support. So some learning objectives that I have for everyone this evening. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Atlantic Marine Conservation Society or AMCs as we refer to ourselves because that can be quite a long name. I'll go over the three different types of cetaceans, the species commonly seen in New York waters, the threats that they're facing today, and of course, how you can help. So first, what is AMCs? AMCs is essentially an organization that was founded by a group of volunteers in 2016 who were looking to make a difference in the environment. As an organization, we are permitted to respond to stranded marine mammals and sea turtles. So some of you might be wondering, well, what is a stranding or what's a stranded animal? So we define that as any injured, sick, or deceased marine mammal or sea turtle that is found floating at the surface or washes up on our shores. These animals can strand for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're just sick. Um, like us, we can get the flu. Um, some of them can as well. So they might just strand because they're not feeling that well. They could strand because of human interaction. So that could be a vessel strike, fishery gear, um, maybe marine debris ingestion. And they could also strand just because of old age. So these animals can live quite a long time. And sometimes when they're nearing the end of their life, they just go into a small cove um, or maybe an estuary, such as the Long Island Sound, where they're out of open water and can uh, somewhat pass peacefully um, without a major threat of predators lurk lurking nearby. And when these animals are deceased, we perform a necropsy, which is an autopsy, but on an animal. And through these necropsies, we really get essentially an inside look at how these animals lived their life and then what caused their life to end. So for us and other scientists and researchers, that's truly very valuable information that we can use to better understand the marine animals that are inhabiting the waters around us. We also do um, health assessments on the wild seal populations uh, around Long Island. So with that, we actually go out and capture seals and we basically collect the same information that a doctor would want from you. So we get their height, their weight. We might take some biological samples from their eyes, their nose, even their mouth. We'll take blood samples. Um, and with those blood samples, we can survey for any, for presence of any diseases. Uh, we'll also attach a flipper tag and a satellite tag. And these satellite tags provide us with really valuable information about how these animals are using the marine environment and maybe they're visiting places that we didn't realize they were going. And then we also host education and outreach events like this one we're doing with you all this evening. And for me, this is one of the best parts of the job because I truly enjoy engaging with members of the public sharing our mission of promoting marine conservation through action and kind of 
filling you in on some real time data that we're getting from our environment and hopefully inspiring um, the next generation of marine scientists. So as I mentioned, we are uh, a small nonprofit organization. We only have about eight staff members. So with that, we rely heavily on our volunteers. So if you look at this image right here, these are two of our field biologists, uh, Jen and Eric, and then two of our volunteers in the white t-shirts. So once our volunteers are trained, they can actually join us uh, and help us respond to strandings, help us with necropsies, um, which is great because these animals really strand all over Long Island and New York. So we could sometimes use some help when we're coming from our offices, which are located in West Hampton Beach. We also have an internship program for high schoolers and college level students. This here is an image of Gabrielle, who was a college intern with us and now actually stayed on as a volunteer because she enjoyed it so much. So this is actually an image of her measuring the shell or the carapace of uh, an endangered Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. So they were in our care over the winter um, when they washed up cold stunned in Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts. Here we is an image of Kim, our uh, lead necropsy coordinator, working with the Marine Patrol. So a lot of these animals don't necessarily strand in the most easy to access places. So we work very closely with our local, state, and federal agencies um, to respond to these animals and perhaps get access to them if we can't get there uh, quite easily on foot. But also all of the animals that we respond to are either protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the Endangered Species Act, which means that it's a federal offense to harass, um, which that's a quite of a large umbrella. That means feed, chase, injure, um, et cetera. So we work very closely with them and we really cherish our relationships with our local state and federal municipalities. And down here, last but certainly not least, it's members of the public. So working with you all, whether it's at education programs like this, beach cleanup events, um, or school programs, Girl Scout, Boy Scout troops, uh, summer camps. We really enjoy just engaging with the public and um, really hoping to get the message across that it takes everyone working together to protect uh, the ecosystem. So on this map here, it is showing the marine mammal and sea turtle strandings from 2017 through 2020. If you look down here at the legend, the blue triangles represent cetaceans, which are what we're talking about this evening. And that is a sample size of 197. The red circles represent the pinnipeds or seals. And that sample size is 326. And then the green squares represent sea turtles. And that had a sample size of 349. So can anybody point out any patterns you might see uh, on this map for our cetaceans, so the blue triangles. Where are they? Where are they stranding? Um, are you notice any any patterns? You can type your answer in the chat if you have an idea. Uh, someone, Ellen, wrote South Shore. Very good. Yes. So a lot of our cetacean species strand along the South Shore. Can anybody think of why that might be? Think of the body of water that's right out here. <laughs> Ellen also wrote the ocean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so out here off the New York by we have the Atlantic Ocean. So a lot of our cetacean species use um, the water just outside of New York uh, as a part of their migration route. So they are coming from the really, really warm uh, Caribbean waters where they go down there for breeding um, and calving, and then they make their way up north um, for the summertime because there's lots of good feeding up here, lots of yummy prey items for them to eat on. So they frequently pass through the waters around New York. Um, and unfortunately, during those migration routes, 
there are un, you know, circumstances that happen that might cause them to strand. So we do see quite a few along the South Shore. And then we also have some scattered in throughout the Long Island Sound. So as I mentioned, some of our older animals might go in there or if they're just in general not feeling well because that's safer. It's out of the deep, um, large Atlantic Ocean. So they come into that estuary um, to kind of figure out how they're feeling. And unfortunately some do pass away and strand within the Long Island Sound. So first we are going to be talking about whales. So there are actually two different types of whales. We have toothed whales and we have baleen whales. Toothed whales are also called odontocetes and that includes oceanic dolphins, river dolphins, porpoises, pilot whales, beaked whales, bottlenose whales, um, and even the killer whale, sperm whale, uh, beluga, and the narwhal. Um, so what do you guys notice about these teeth? And maybe you know, you're familiar with some of those um, animals I just listed. What kind of prey items do you think they're going to be eating if they've got nice large teeth? We have someone that said meat. Yes, so they are mostly meat eaters, very good. But what kind of meat? Are they gonna be eating like super small organisms? Maybe something a little bigger? What do you think? All right, well, I'll tell you guys. So these whales are gonna be eating larger prey items. So something like um, larger fish items, they might even be going for, if they're up in the Arctic, penguins, seals. Um, some of them will actually eat other types of whales. Um, so they really don't discriminate um, and they will even eat um, stingrays. Some of our orca species will eat stingrays so they definitely utilize their teeth to their advantage with those larger prey items. With our baleen whales, as you can see in this photo, they have um, large baleen plates um, with many rows of baleen. And uh, the baleen whales are also called mysticetes. Uh, and they feed by filtering or straining their food uh, from the water. So they actually are at, feeding at the surface typically, take a big swallow of water. They actually push the water back out and then what's left in their mouth is all those small organisms at the surface. So typically krill, shrimp, some smaller fish species, um, some zooplankton. So with these whales though, they're typically the largest. So if they're the largest whales and eating those small organisms, they have to eat tons of food every day just to be able to maintain their body systems. So getting into our first whale species, we're gonna go over the sperm whale. So the sperm whale is the largest of the toothed whales. The females can grow to be about 35 feet long and males can grow to be 50 feet. They're found in all deep oceans ranging from the equator to the Arctic. And they're actually named after the waxy substance spermaceti that's found in their heads. Uh, so the spermaceti is an oil sac that helps them focus sound. And it was used in oil lamps and lubricants and candles back when these whales were targeted by the whaling industry. And they were targeted for over 150 years, um, specifically looking for the spermaceti. And you might be wondering, what are they doing in this photo? Well, um, something interesting about sperm whales is that they will actually rest vertical in the water column and they'll rest and sleep in that position, uh, which is quite interesting, but they don't typically do it alone. They're usually in a group um, because safety in numbers. So moving on to the blue whale. So if you guys didn't know, it's thought that the blue whale is the largest animal to ever inhabit earth. They grow to be about a hundred feet long, but they feed on really small crustaceans like shrimp. So they have to consume up to about eight tons of food every day. 
And due to the commercial whaling industry, the population is less than 10% of what it originally was. Um, so hopefully these guys will be around for quite a long time though, because I think it's amazing that still to this day, uh, we have the largest animal ever to inhabit hearth um, still here with us. So now moving on to the fin whale. Uh, so it's the second largest whale. They grow to be about 88 feet long. So just 12 feet shy of the blue whale. And depending on where they are, they'll eat fish and small crustaceans. Um, so kind of just depending on where they're located um, in the world's oceans. They have uh, quite a small dorsal fin um, back here on their back. So the dorsal fin is located on the top of the animal and it is quite small. So typically we can identify these guys out there based on their very long body, their coloring, and then that small dorsal fin. So now moving on to dolphins. So of course we have the bottlenose dolphin in our waters. So bottlenose dolphins are one of the most popular species of dolphins uh, in the world. So they're commonly seen most places. Uh, something really interesting about the bottlenose dolphin though is that like most dolphins, they travel in pods, uh, but their pods are mostly made up of females. So um, there's a matriarch within them. Uh, it's typically mothers, daughters, they're familially related. Um, and if a female dolphin has a male calf, he actually gets kicked out of the pod around two to three years old, kind of depending how fast he matures. Um, why do you guys think moms would kick their male calves out of the pod? Why would they do that? Does anyone have an idea? You can type it right in the chat. Um, Ellen wrote, can't get the others pregnant. Exactly. Yes. So if and you have he to had, start their own families, yeah. And to start their own families. Very good. Yes. So if they're within a pod of females that they're mainly related to, you don't necessarily want them um, procreating with a closely related relative because um, that could definitely cause some genetic issues down the line. So yes, the males do get the boot out of the pod once they reach that age and they'll actually go out and they'll find um, their own like male best friend. So with our bottlenose dolphin species, um, a, the bond between two males is thought to be one of the strongest bonds in the animal kingdom. They will hunt together. They will mate with females together. They'll defend each other from predators. They're basically best friends for life in the animal world. Um, and they've actually noticed that with different dolphin species, there could be up to three males that have bonded together. And typically those are gonna be smaller dolphins um, that are working together because remember safety in numbers. And then if they're about medium sized or average size, then it's gonna be the two males. And then say there are some dolphin species where males can be grow to be quite large. And so those males are kind of solo swimmers. They're off on their own. They don't need help from anybody else. Um, so typically if you're seeing a smaller group of dolphins out there, like maybe two to three, it's probably males. And if you are seeing larger pods, it's probably predominantly made up of females which I just find very interesting. Um, and these dolphins are also very intelligent, curious, playful animals. Uh, bottlenose, you can fairly easily identify out there in the wild. They've got um, gray shading, um, a nice crescent shaped dorsal fin and kind of a, a shorter, more blunt ended uh, rostrum. Now getting into our Atlantic spotted dolphins. So these guys are typically found offshore, uh, obviously named for their spots. So they are quite easy to identify out there in open water. Um, you might notice that they might look a little more slender than our bottlenose dolphins, because they are um, a little bit more fit uh, and they've got a longer skinnier rostrum. Their dorsal fin is somewhat quite narrow, but still has that crescent shape. Um, again, the spots, and they almost have somewhat of like a pink underbelly um, when you see them out there. 
Uh, so with these offshore species, they're going to be feeding on fish, squid, um, a variety of animals that they can find throughout the water column. Then we have the Rizzo's dolphin. So you might notice this guy looks quite different from the two other dolphin species we just went over. So the Rizzo's dolphin is uh, mainly black and then this white shading um, that almost looks like maybe some scratches on them uh, is somewhat scratches. So the Rizzo's dolphins um, and like many other dolphin species, they're going to interact and be curious with their mouths and their teeth because they don't have hands like us. So they're using their mouths um, and sometimes that might come into aggression with each other. And so they leave what we would call rake marks where they're essentially biting and scratching with their teeth um, on each other's bodies. And so that is what has happened here with this Rizzo dolphin. Um, that's what the white looking lines are. It's nothing to be concerned about. It's very normal out there um, with these dolphin species. If you take a look at their head, they also don't have a normal looking rostrum. So it's kind of a blunt end to their head or face. Um, and then this is their mouth right here. So they don't necessarily have a very long um, rostrum to use to um, interact with their environment. So now getting into porpoises. So we do have harbor porpoises in our waters and you guys might immediately notice a couple of differences between them and the dolphins. So they have more of a triangular shaped dorsal fin where our dolphins had more of a crescent or curved shaped dorsal fin. Also, they don't really have that long rostrum. So it's kind of similar to how a Rizzo's dolphin is shaped. And then you might notice that they are darker on top and lighter on the bottom. And we call this counter shading. Can anybody think of why an animal would have counter shading? What's the purpose of that? This one might take a minute to type out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to take a guess. Any answer is a good answer. We have a response, so they're not eaten. Someone okay. else wrote so they could hide. Mm -hmm. See if anyone right. else has an answer. To act as camouflage. Very good, all very good answers. So oh, imagine if you are swimming on the surface of the water and you look down and a harbor porpoise is below you, if you just see the dark top of them, it's gonna look like it's blending into that deeper ocean water or maybe even the ocean sediment if it's shallow. So it definitely does camouflage them. And then same for if you were swimming below a harbor porpoise and you turn to look up towards the belly, but also towards the water surface, that sun is shining through. It, when you see their white bellies, it's gonna kind of blend in to that surface. So you're not going to see them as clearly. Um, so yes, counter shading is definitely a way that they protect themselves from predators um, and camouflage themselves, very good. So what do they eat? So they eat a lot of fish. Um, something funny about our dolphin species, especially our bottlenose, is that they have been known to play with their food. So obviously they never got the manners lesson at the dinner table with their parents. Um, they will kind of toss around their food. Uh, they do this with stingrays as well, which aren't really a food item for them, more of a play toy. Um, and I just feel like sometimes they don't remember that stingrays have very sharp barbs on the end they will use to defend themselves. So many dolphins have come in contact with those barbs, which can actually be pretty bad news for them uh, because those barbs can kind of make their way to their lungs or their heart. Um, they've even had them lodged in their eyes before. And once it gets stuck in there, it can certainly cause an infection, which could eventually lead to them passing away from the stingray barb. Um, so hopefully they have learned from their mistakes over the years. Uh, so they do eat a lot of fish um, around here. That's a lot of herring. Um, there's porgies um, and just really a variety of fish. They're not too picky, um, but again, definitely not the most pleasant of eaters. 
and they use tools. So there are two populations of bottlenose dolphins in the world that have been heavily studied. There's the population in Sarasota Bay, and then there's Florida, and then there's the population in Shark Bay, Australia. So researchers have found that the bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay, Australia actually use tools. So they use these sponges that you can see here and they hold it between their um, top and bottom jaw and they will go and dig in the sediment or the bottom of the seafloor to stir up fish. And then once the fish have come out, they'll release the sponge and go for their prey. But they use this sponge to protect their rostrum from any scratches or damage that it could come in contact with when it's digging in the sediment. The researchers also found that only females do this technique and the mothers pass it down to their daughters. So they're kind of sharing this uh, tool technique and keeping it within the family, which I just find incredibly interesting. So krill, I mentioned that our baleen or the um, filter feeding whales eat lots of small organisms. So that is going to include krill. Um, and they're going to find that predominantly at the surface um, when they are filter feeding. But again, with those large whales, they have to eat tons of krill every day um, just to be able to maintain their body processes like normal digestion and energy levels. Um, so something to think about. I don't know if I would prefer to be a filter feeder or an odontocete with those bigger teeth going for the bigger prey items. So I do have a couple of videos that we're going to show you um, that show these um, first odontocetes uh, working together to hunt, um, which is a topic that we're going to get into just after this. People come to Antarctica for the wildlife, but today on board the National Geographic Explorer, we found something spectacular. A pot of killer whales spy hopping in the distance, narrowing in on their target, a crab eater seal upon the ice. Four innocent seals sitting on the ice and the intelligent pot of, I guess it was four whales, were systematically <laughs> knocking him off the ice. And he was fast as, as heck and was scooting back onto the ice every time. What they're doing is a tactic that is found only amongst these species using their conjoined effort to wave wash the seal off the ice. After several attempts of trying to wash the crab eater seal off of the ice flow, the killer whales tried to crack the ice into smaller pieces. They chipped away and chipped away until they destroyed the ice. The ice flow that the seal is upon is growing smaller and smaller. But it has escaped and found another ice flow on the starboard side. run and as soon as they made the run and their backs were turned he made a dash perpendicular to where they were he got away man can't believe it <laughs> took off running the group decided to name the seal kevin and uh, kevin got away so it was uh, good news for all of us and a great time on board this is truly one of the most amazing encounters any of us have witnessed in the wild.
So looking at that, you guys might have noticed how it was four orcas working together to try to knock the seal off of the ice. So that is a learned behavior. So they are teaching each other how to do that. You might have noticed there might have been a smaller orca in the pod. So they're probably showing that younger juvenile how to use the waves to knock the prey item uh, off of the ice cap. Um, but something that you have to realize is that when they're working together doing that behavior, they're actually using a lot of energy in order to um, get that larger prey. So big risk for a big reward, where if they were just going for fish or maybe some stingrays, they wouldn't have to use that much energy. But they were using quite a bit to continuously swim to knock that seal off of the ice. And something with orcas is that they actually share their prey items with their pods. So not one orca would have gotten that seal. They probably would have shared it amongst the four of them and maybe some other orcas were hanging out nearby that were a part of their pod. So it's definitely very interesting um, and a learned behavior that they are passing down from generation to generation. So that was the odontocetes working together. And now we are going to turn to our mysticetes uh, and see how they work together. Well, we're spending our morning watching one of the most exciting biological phenomena any place to be seen, the bubble net feeding behavior of humpback whales. It is exciting in the extreme. You got a group of animals all traveling together. They know where the prey is before they dive or have some sense of it. A single animal breaks off from the group dive down, it starts spiraling upwards and blowing that, uh, blowing air out of its blowhole, which rises up and creates that cylinder of bubbles. Now, almost certainly they're doing that above where the fish are located because of the constraints on bubbles traveling to the surface. They can't be that deep when they deploy it, and the fish tend to be located below that depth. So the remaining animals are, have to force that prey up into that pre-existing bubble net that's already been deployed. And so what seems to happen is one individual will vocalize in an effort to drive the fish up towards the surface while the remaining animals seem to flank that group of herring, that school of herring, chain them, corral them as they're being pushed into the existing bubble net. And then once that happens, just before they break the surface when this occurs, they, the whales actually come from the outside of the bubble net, convene in the center and do that final push to the surface. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that video as well. Um, so that's just showing how those mysticetes, um, specifically the humpback whales, work together to feed and share their prey items as well. Uh, so again, learn behaviors, working together. Um, it's something that you don't see you know, too often in the marine environment, um, except with our cetacean species, which is, just really shows how sophisticated they are. So now moving into what species do we see the most often in New York? So we do see bottlenose dolphins. So they're found um, within Shinnecock Bay, specifically these photos are taken. Um, so again, bottlenose are quite easy to identify out there because of their gray shading, their um, crescent shaped dorsal fin. Uh, and with the gray shading also, something to note is that the lighter it is, that means that they're more of a coastal um, bottlenose dolphin where the offshore species are actually a little bit darker. Um, so even if you saw a darker dolphin, but it looked similar to a bottlenose, it could still be a bottlenose, but it's just from offshore. Um, so it'd be interesting to find them uh, inshore and not stranded. And remember, these guys travel in pods, um, which could be just a few of them because maybe they're males, or it could be quite a large number, like upwards of 20 to 30. So we also find the short-beaked common dolphin. So these guys Obviously a little bit darker on top. They've got a white side and white on their pectoral flippers. They've got a fairly long skinny rostrum and their dorsal fin is nice and crescent shaped, um, but not 
as curved as the bottlenose dolphin. So these guys are also found uh, throughout the word, world. They're quite common uh, to see. They're very social, very energetic. These guys are also going to be found uh, swimming in pods. Um, and they can actually be found in what we call megapods, where uh, it consists of almost thousands of animals, could be up to around 10,000. Um, and these large groups are thought to consist of subgroups of 20 to 30 individuals that might be related to each other, or they might be separated by their age or maybe their sex. Um, so, but they've all come together to either migrate together um, or just be together um, out there in the open ocean. Uh, but something interesting about these guys is that they usually rest during the day and then they feed at night. Um, and they typically feed along um, continental shelves where upwelling is occurring. And upwelling is the process of when deep cold water um, that's very nutrient rich actually rises towards the surface. And that's where prey is quite abundant. Um, so these guys are pretty smart to be hunting at night um, in those areas. So then we have the minke whale. So these are, it's a type of baleen whale. Um, and usually you can figure that by their throat grooves, which are down here. These guys are quite easy to identify out in the wild. They've got the white belly with a little bit of shading creeping up on the side and they do have white on their pectoral flippers. Um, they can grow to be somewhere between 25 to 35 feet long. Um, so actually not too big um, in comparison to some of our other whale species that we find. Um, and their dorsal fin uh, is quite obvious out there. So it's a nice crescent shape, but it is dark and situated a little bit farther uh, back on the top of the body. And then we have humpback whales. So obviously this is a picture of a mother and a calf. Um, we do have these animals in our waters. Uh, and before the moratorium on whaling uh, in 1985, all populations of humpback whales were greatly reduced, some by 95%. And thankfully the species is increasing in abundance, um, but they do face quite a few threats that we're gonna go over uh, in just a few slides. But these whales live all around the world and they travel incredible distances every year from uh, their uh, calving grounds to their feeding grounds. Uh, some populations will swim 5,000 miles um, during their migration. It's one of the longest migrations of any mammal on the planet. But these whales specifically feed on crustaceans like krill and some smaller fish um, and they are baleen so they are eating tons of food every day um, when they're in their feeding grounds. Um, and these guys can actually be individually identified based on the patterns that are found on the underside of their flukes or their tail. It's kind of like how we all have thumbprints that we can be identified by they can be identified by the patterns uh, on their tails, which are very interesting. I'm gonna play a quick um, song, if you will. So these guys do um, sing songs um, is what a lot of people call it. Uh, and a lot of these songs are by males and it's used to attract females. So their songs can be heard for over 20 miles away, uh, especially the low frequency portions in the deeper water. Um, and the males will actually change up this song from year to year. So to kind of keep it interesting and fresh and new, um, they will project these different songs um, and attract females. Now moving on to the North Atlantic right whale. So they are one of the most endangered species um, of the marine environment today. Uh, there's only probably less than 400 left at this point. Um, and they actually got their name because they were considered the right whale to hunt when whaling uh, these animals was still legal. Um, and they were considered right because they were slow moving and they actually floated at the surface after they were killed. Um, 
they are baleen whales and they're feeding mainly on tiny crustaceans. Um, so again, eating quite a bit of food every day. Um, and these guys were, you know, hunted almost to the brink of extinction. Um, so they are, we're hopeful that they're slowly coming back and their population numbers are increasing. We were lucky enough to have a mom and calf pair just off of the Hamptons um, in late February, early March, um, which was very exciting because any time really anybody spots a North Atlantic right whale calf, it really gives you a little bit of a glimmer of hope that this population is rebounding and that animal will survive and hopefully produce a calf, you know, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, so it was a very exciting time to have those animals spotted off of our coastline. So looking at this map, this is showing you the large whale strandings for the New York bite from 2017 through 2019. We're still trying to get through uh, some of our 2020 whale data. Um, so that's why it's not included in here yet. Um, but as you can see, the blue squares down here actually represent our uh, humpback whales. So as you can see, they are quite popular uh, for our strandings along the southern shore of Long Island. Um, so with these large whales, we respond whether it's alive or deceased. Um, and we're actually a part of the team that disentangles these whales. Um, and we're going to get into those details in just a little bit but we will provide care uh, for any live large whale that strands on our shoreline. Unfortunately, these large whales aren't necessarily um, considered as candidates for uh, rehab because it most likely wouldn't be successful. These large whales need large tanks and deep tanks. And that's not, sorry, um, that's not necessarily available to us. Um, so if the whales cannot be immediately refloated um, after a veterinarian assessment, um, then we'll have to look at some other options. But large whales do strand along our coastline, um, so you never know when and where it could happen. So now we're going to get into some of the threats that they're facing today. So marine debris ingestion is one of the main threats for any marine animal. Uh, this is an image of a Rizzo's dolphin that's stranded. This is Kim, our lead necropsy coordinator. Uh, and unfortunately, when we did the necropsy, we found this very large 30 gallon trash bag and um, these smaller plastic bags as well um, within the main stomach of the animal. Um, and it was marine debris ingestion that was determined to be the cause of death. And that call was made because of the blubber thickness. So our cetacean species have a very thick blubber layer um, and they will utilize that blubber layer, which is also their lipid storage when they're having trouble finding prey items um, or if they've ingested marine debris like this and perhaps it's clogging their digestive tract, so they're not able to eat other foods, they're gonna be utilizing those fat stores for energy. And so they're going to deplete their blubber layer over time if they're not able to consume their um, normal prey items. And unfortunately, that is what happened with this animal and caused its demise. So with this animal, um, this is actually a female say whale that stranded down in Virginia. So not New York, um, but definitely something that we want to take note of because it could certainly happen here. This uh, say whale is a baleen whale. So they feed at the surface and this whole DVD case and what looks like to be part of a DVD case was found in this animal's stomach um, or GI contents um, when they performed the necropsy. And it was determined to be the cause of death as well. So unfortunately, a lot of the whales that we see in our waters are baleen whales. So they're going to be filter feeding this food. Um, so marine debris that is sitting at the surface, which is quite common, um, especially for our plastic items that float, um, are, have a potential to cause immense harm to these animals. Now moving into entanglements. Uh, so this is actually an image of a humpback whale that was entangled in the New York bite last summer. Uh, this is an image of the 
Center for Coastal Studies team. Um, so they came down uh, and, and were able to help us disentangle this four-year-old um, humpback whale. And it was uh, entangled around its flukes. And I've got an image to show you of that in just a couple slides. Um, but this animal was reported stranded and it was there for four days while we were preparing and kind of working out logistics for how we were going to respond to this whale. It's not as easy as jumping in the water and cutting it loose um, with these stranded animals, especially large whales. Um, there is definitely a high risk of injury. So it's something that had to take a few days to plan accordingly. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately how it was um, entangled, it was still able to keep its head at the surface. So it was still able to get air through its blowhole, but it wasn't swimming, it wasn't feeding. So we put a team together, went to disentangle it. Thankfully the disentanglement was successful, but as you can see in this image, the gear was wrapped around the peduncle, which is that muscular part of the animal right before their flukes or their tail. Um, and then it was just hanging down to the bottom of the seafloor. Um, so thankfully, this was a huge success story because this animal was then seen um, just a couple weeks later um, by Cressley during one of their whale watching um, trips out at Montauk and it was seen free swimming. It's um, cuts that were caused by the entanglement were healing well. Um, so that was a very happy moment for everybody to see that whale free swimming um, and acting as a whale should out there in the marine environment. So now getting into vessel strikes. Um, so unfortunately, this does happen quite a bit. Um, and sadly, this is an image of a North Atlantic right whale calf. Uh, so this was actually taken earlier this year down in St. Augustine, Florida. A vessel had um, come in contact with a whale. They did report it to the Coast Guard, which was great. Um, and then the whale did wash up. So teams down there in Florida were prepared for this animal to be washing ashore. Um, unfortunately, with our whales and our dolphins, seals, even sea turtles, these vessel strikes can be quite devastating for them. Um, there are injuries caused by shark force trauma, which would be from the propeller of a boat, um, which is pictured here in this photo or blunt force trauma, which would be more of a crushing, and that's usually caused by the hull or the skeg of a boat. Um, so not always can these animals heal from these lacerations. Uh, and unfortunately, um, that was the case for this North Atlantic right whale calf. And I think a lot of people within the science community were quite devastated by this death um, because it's a North Atlantic right whale uh, and their population numbers are so low and this animal you know, was quite young. Uh, so unfortunately, vessel strikes is something that we do see quite a bit, especially up here during the summertime because there's more boats in the water, more activity out there. Um, so if you guys are ever boating out there on the water, make sure you go slow, be aware of your surroundings because um, you don't know if there's a marine animal near you. So the last threat that we will talk about this evening is ocean noise. And I have this video to show you that I think will explain it quite better than I could with words. Cetaceans have lived in our oceans for millions of years. The smallest one, the Hector's dolphin, is about 20 times smaller than the blue whale, the largest living organism on Earth. Its heart is so big that a person could almost stand in it. Cetaceans find their way even in darkest ocean depths. They emit calls and detect obstacles and prey from the reflected echoes. Cetaceans often communicate with each other. They stay in touch by calling to each other when spread out and likely exchange information on the occurrence of prey or predators. Some species can only reproduce because they can communicate over hundreds of kilometers and thus find each other. But underwater noise is increasingly masking the acoustic world of cetaceans. Noise levels in the oceans have doubled every decade for the past 60 years in some areas due to various human activities. Without countermeasures, underwater noise will further increase. Over 90% of world trade is transported by ship. Ship propellers generate intense noise. 
Cetaceans are exposed to ever-present noise in major shipping routes. Once a ship has passed, another will follow shortly. Chronic noise causes stress, which in turn affects the health of cetaceans and may also reduce their breeding success. Whales are acutely threatened during military exercises when warships turn on their sonar. The extremely loud sonar sounds spread for tens to hundreds of miles in all directions and are used to detect submarines. Whales appear to change their diving behavior in panic to escape the noise. This seems to cause divers bends or decompression sickness affecting vital organs, which can lead to death. Some fatally injured or dead animals beach on the shore, but many die unnoticed in the open sea and sink. The noise caused by seismic exploration for oil and gas is also loud, pervasive, and continuous. During the ship surveys, seismic air guns produce intense pulsed noise every few seconds, often for weeks or months. Air gun pulses are so loud that they can travel through thousands of meters of water and penetrate tens to hundreds of kilometers into the Earth's crust. The echo reverberates from oil and gas deposits all the way back to the measuring devices at the surface. The noise can cause the marine environment to be heavily degraded over large areas, forcing some marine life to abandon their habitat. Thus, the livelihood of cetaceans may be destroyed, and so their life. Underwater noise pollution is a serious threat to marine life. Together, we can change this situation. So hopefully you guys were able to enjoy that video. I know it's a little bit of a hard topic um, and it's also hard to uh, understand because we can't see it and we're not necessarily hearing it either. Um, but ocean noise is definitely having a huge impact, um, especially on our cetacean species uh, who use um, sounds to communicate with each other. So just as a reminder, we did talk about marine debris a little bit this evening. So if you are going to the beach or even just your neighborhood park or a state park, um, we just ask that you take your trash with you and any other trash that you might find when you're there so that we prevent it from ending up in the marine environment. Please be sure to stay 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle, whether in the water or on the beach. So remember these animals are federally protected. Uh, so we need to give them their space um, and the law asks that we do that as well. Report any marine mammal and sea turtle sightings to us. So we have a page on our website, but you could also directly email us at sightings at ANCs.org. And Sammy will put that email in the chat. So I know I talked about how we respond to stranded animals, but we also really like to receive reports of healthy marine animals that are out thriving in their environment and doing what they should be doing. So if you guys spot a dolphin, a whale, a sea turtle, even a seal, and they look healthy and they're swimming, uh, please let us know. Also, please report any sick, injured, or deceased marine mammals or sea turtles to the New York State Training Hotline. We will also put this number in the chat, but it is 631-369-9829. And I suggest if you have your phone nearby, go ahead and put it in your phone because you never know when you're going to need this phone number. It's not typically a marine biologist that's out walking along the beach and comes across a marine mammal or sea turtle that needs help. It's a member of the general public. So if you go ahead and have this number in your phone, then you've really taken the first step to making sure that that animal gets the care uh, that it needs in a timely manner. So with that, does anybody have any questions? And you can feel free to um, unmute yourself if you're comfortable, uh, or you can put your questions in the chat and Sammy will read them out. We got a thank you, very interesting comment. Thank you. Well, I know I kind of put a lot of information out there this evening. So if you guys think of any questions, 
later on, whether it's tonight or in the next few days, uh, please feel free to email me. Again, my name is Lindsay, and this is my email right here, education at amcs.org. Um, and please feel free to email me any of your questions or comments, and hopefully I am able to answer them for you. With that, we do have one question from Sarah. What is your favorite part of your work? Oh, that is a good question and a hard question. Absolutely. I would say my favorite part is being able to share our work in real time with members of the public. So we're not waiting to publish a big manuscript um, about our research. We want to share it with you as soon as possible so that you know what's going on in your backyard. And as the education coordinator, that's a huge component of my job um, and something that I really value as well. And I hope that um, the people I'm sharing it with um, value it um, just as much. <laughs> Someone wrote, thank you. They learned so much. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. And it looks like we got a little applause emoji as well at the top. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I want to say thank you everyone for joining us this evening and taking time out of your evening to spend it with us and learn about the citations of New York. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, we would be happy to hear them. And please remember to report your sightings um, and strandings. We did get one more question about how do you become a volunteer? That is a great question. If you would like to email me and Sammy will put my email in the chat um, as well as our volunteers email. So it's volunteers at amcs.org. Uh, please email both of those um, and we will get you set up. But typically our volunteers start by coming to an orientation and we have an orientation once a month. It's virtual so you can do it from the comfort of your home. And then that orientation will kind of give you a better introduction to our organization and all the different components that you could be a part of. Um, and then if you're interested in helping with strandings and necropsies, we would try start your training for that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, this is Lee with the library. Thanks, thanks again for the great presentation. It was it was really informative. We all really appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so much, Lee, for having us. We really enjoyed uh, being with you all this evening, um, and hope we can do it again in the future. <laughs> thanks again. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thanks, Carly. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye. evening. Thank you. And...